welcome to everyone this evening. If you're a guest with us this evening, we're so glad to have you in service tonight. If you're watching us online, to those of you that are a part of us watching online, we welcome you. And to anyone watching us online, we welcome you as a part of this service this evening. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. You may be seated. I'm I'm starting. I gotta I wanna I wanna lay a little foundation before I get to where or as I get to where we're going. Some of you, let me just give you a brief, really brief history lesson. A number of you know this, at least the basics of it, but 1998, my wife and I were were ordained as co-pastors of Antioch the Apostolic Church. At that time, it was just Antioch the Apostolic Church. There wasn't north, south, east, west, central, whatever else. We spent uh, from 98 until uh, 2009, with the exception of a, I don't know, a year or two in there, we worked with the Kimbrels and a few other folks, um, uh, sort of a preaching point in Severna Park. In 1990, um, or excuse me, in 2009 is when um, we shifted, uh, my brother, came to lead the congregation here on Sunday mornings, and my family and I traveled around. We had anywhere from 15 to 20 different locations we were meeting on Sundays. But leading up to that time, that that first season that I was responsible for leading this congregation, at some point during that time, there there was a passage the Lord laid on my heart. And, um... For a long time, I thought it was just about that particular time and season. And uh, several years ago, the Lord brought it back to me, and I realized that it was more than just for that. And in fact, truly, actually, the timing of it really wasn't when He gave it to me. It was more for the, the last several years, and then a couple of years ago now, as I had shared this verse, I don't remember what kind of session it was, but Brother Middleton, Brother Glenn Middleton came to me and said, I, I feel like the Lord told me to tell you basically that verse is not, it's not something you do and you move on. That's going to be it continually. And, and so those verses are this, Isaiah chapter 54, and um, I'm going to, I'm gonna, I don't usually do this on Sunday nights, but I'm going to use my iPad this evening, ex- assuming all of this works. The, um, the devil has been in the sound and media today. So, ah, look at that. Hallelujah. Praise God. Um, so, Isaiah 54, beginning with verse number 1, the scripture says, Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that, didst travail, that thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. And it's these next couple of verses. I'm reading that for, I guess, a little bit of context. But it's these next couple of verses that are the, the specific verses that the Lord gave me. Enlarge the place of your tent. Let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitation. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. For thou shalt, when you do this, thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. I don't have time to break down some of the typology of verse number 2, but, but let me just tell you that in the last six years, which the beginning of June this year was six years as Antioch Central, 
Uh, it's hard to believe that it's already been six years since those changes were made and Antioch West was formed and Antioch North was uh, formed as well and, and the current structure that we have now was, is, is basically when that started. But it, it took us, uh, I should have, I'm, I'm not quite as good with Bishop on a lot of timeline and dates. He's got a crazy memory. But, but, but it, from 2016, I, I think it was well into 2017 that there, there was, it was almost like the predominant spirit in this congregation was a spirit of grieving. Because it felt like there was a great loss because we had brothers and sisters that were all a part of here and came together that went to some of the other congregations and, and, and our, our worshiping together and other dynamics were changed. And, and in fact, I, I, don't remember, uh, I, I don't remember if it was uh, 2016 or 20, if I'm not mistaken, it was 2017, Brother, Brother Paul Sharp was speaking one night where when the board of trustees were in town, and, and he, he, he kind of addressed that. And, 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 and so it took us a little while just to kind of get our bearings. But, but then in, uh, in 2018 is when we, we did a complete uh, revamp and, and, and overhaul of small group ministry and how we do it here at Antioch Central. And, and that's when we created our, 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 our new... Uh, Oikis, I think, is what I've been told is the plural of oikos, um, and 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 we started down this this path of of some new sort of some degree of new principles, new ways of doing some things, and I got to tell you, for for months and months and months, it was it was it was a grind, and uh, it it there was a lot of days I wasn't sure if we had done the right thing and headed down the right path. But, but it, we, we kept going, and i got to tell you today, it is amazing week after week as I read reports, um, just on a regular week, not on a week when we've had gatherings, but just on a regular week, the, the things that are taking place throughout our groups and the, the growth and the development of groups, some of them more so numerically, others of them in the spiritual maturity and development of that group. And, and uh, so far, every time we've had an Oikos gathering instead of a church service, the combined attendance of all of our groups on that evening has been larger than the service on that night. And if you think that means we ought to switch and go to the rest of it, come to me. I'll talk to you and explain why we're not doing that. Because numbers by themselves don't drive our decisions. But it, it, it's amazing. And, 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 and then in uh, 2020, lots of crazy things happened in 2020. But 2020 is when we launched the Grow Discipleship process. And, and uh, COVID definitely had uh, some, some, some uh, effects on that and the, and the quickness of that getting off the ground. But we've, we've plotted along, and, and, and uh, I, I know not everybody's fully bought in, but there's some, there's some folks that have bought in. We've got several, uh, and I mean this with the utmost respect and affection, but we've got some old-timers that have been around here for 30-plus years that have completed all of the available material for the GROW process. And I say available because there's still a couple of things that are kind of waiting on my wife and I to get finished. And, and then there's some new folks that have been around just eating it up. I don't want to embarrass anybody or single anybody out, but we, we met for a few minutes Friday morning with Sister Olivia, and she, she referenced it. And there's others that have just been, just been using it and developing and growing and, and so that, that, those are some things in the context of the verse that I just read that are a part of lengthening the cords and strengthening the stakes. And, and we've enlarged the place of our tent, and, and we're going to do that even more. We've heard over the last uh, eight months or so, whatever, going back to December when Brother Herring preached the first night here, he preached about church planners and expansion for Antioch Central. And uh, there's some things that are in the works right now that I think within just the next couple of weeks or so, we're going to be taking another step with another group. And so all of those things are a part of lengthening the cord, strengthening the stakes, enlarging the place of our habitation. 
The bottom line is, I'd be the first to acknowledge that none of those things are perfect. The bottom line is, none of those things are functioning to the fullest degree that I want them and many others hope for them to function. The bottom line is, you know, in a lot of different areas, if you sit around and wait till you get everything perfect, you're never going to do anything because it's never going to get perfect. And so I, I believe we've spent the last six years perfecting. Notice I didn't say it's perfect, perfecting. Perfecting is an ongoing process. It's a continuing process. So we have spent the last six years perfecting these things. I, I've said it numerous times now in the last several years for this congregation. I think you can boil down the, the responsibility, the purpose of the church into two categories. That basically everything we do falls into two categories. Equipping and evangelizing. Equipping saints for the work of their ministry, that's what Paul said the fivefold ministry is for. Preparing, training, equipping, because this is not a spectator sport. This is not for you to come and watch me or any other individual perform. We are a team. We are a body. We have different members, different roles, different places. But this is a body and every member of the body has a purpose and an important place. So that's one dimension and the other is evangelizing. And it's, it's really, an, you, you, have, you equip those that are saved and you get more people that come in and then you equip those and you just keep it going. So I want to read some verses to you and then I, I, I'm going I'm, I'm to uh, read some verses to you. How about that? And, and, then, and then we'll go from there. Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 13. Our Brother Middleton prayed it some during prayer this evening. I realize some of you weren't here yet, but, but, but I, 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 it, this, is, this is pointless tonight if you don't choose to mix the word with faith. If you don't choose to make up your mind, I believe what you... I, I'm not here tonight by the help of the Lord, just to give you again some speech. I've come to deliver a message, but that message is only going to be benefit you individually and us as a congregation if we will mix it with faith. Matthew 5 and 13 says, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt hath lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. The Living Bible says it this way, You are the world's seasoning to make it tolerable. The church is supposed to be seasoning the world, not the world seasoning the church. I said the church is supposed to be seasoning the world, not the world seasoning the church. And I'm sorry to tell you, it seems to be more and more that it's the world seasoning the church. And I'm not talking about just some generic category of the church. I'm even talking about apostolics. You are the world seasoning to make it tolerable. If you lose your flavor, what will happen to the world? You want to know what's happening to the world? The church is losing its flavor. It's not the government's fault. It's not Hollywood's fault. It's not the political party's fault. The reason the world's in the condition it's in is because the church is not seasoning the world the way the church was called to season the world. Uh-oh. Oh boy, I, I, I'm okay right now, but Lord, we need this to work in a moment at least, so here we go. If you lose your flavor, what will happen to the world? We're seeing what will happen to the world. And you yourselves will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless as worthless. You are the world's light. A city on a hill, glowing in the night for all to see. 
The Message Bible says it this way. Let me tell you why you are here. Let me tell you why you are here. Let me tell you why you are here. I'm going to tell you, the enemy doesn't want me not only preaching this tonight, but he doesn't want you getting a hold of it. I I don't, I don't, I I, I had no intention of doing this. I don't over-spiritualize things. In fact, sometimes I probably don't give enough credit to some things for the spiritual connection. And and, and I'm sorry, but some people make everything so spiritual. I don't think it is. But but at the same time, and I really had no intention of saying this because part of me is... My pride doesn't even want to say it. But I I said it this morning. I'm not going to go through all of it this morning. But we've lived in the house that we've lived in for four years now. And uh, we're, we're across the street. The houses across the street from us, they are, they are waterfront houses, and there's lots of woods, and, and our yard is full of ivy and shrubs and all that. And, and in four years, the four years, this July was four years, and the four years we've lived there, we have never seen a snake. And I know if Julian Middleton was living there, that would not be a nice thing. But that's a great thing for me. And in the last 30 days, I have encountered one of them very close proximity, sticking its head out of my grill. Listen to this morning. If you weren't here, you can hear the story. That was on July 4th, and then yesterday it was outside blowing leaves and or blowing some stuff off the yard and whatever. And I come around front and pest control guy was there and Jacob's standing out there and he's got post hole diggers and I'm so what's going on and you know he he knows my f- hatred and fear of snakes so he tried to you know oh you don't normally stand in front of somebody's window with a post hole diggers for no reason <laughs> it was another snake that one somehow got found some kind of way it, it's right under our bay window and Somehow I found a ledge or something up, and we tried. Jacob had the had a hoe and was scraping around. I had the blower already, and and I I, I was blowing, trying to. And at one point he jumped, he came down and started out, and and we won't tell you what happened from there because uh, both my sons in laws had a chance to really earn great brownie points by killing snakes, and neither one of them succeeded. So I don't know. I don't know about that. <laughs> That's the beauty of having the microphone. I'm scared, I, so I, I'm admitting that. But, but I got to tell and I'm, I'm telling you, I don't, I, I said it for some reason a couple of months ago, I think, in a service. If, if there's ever find a snake in our house, it's probably going on the market. I just, I can't. Some of you have had them. God bless you. I, I heard, Sister Prasad, you had one in a coat one time. Lord, help us. But but I got to tell you I I I was I was battling fear last night and it it just it kind of crossed my mind this morning I wonder because we go back to the garden we know that snakes and the primary thing that that snakes cause for me is fear I mean I battled for hours last night in fact I told you I want to get on the, all the details but I've got a I got about a four foot stick that now sits in my back door, and every time I go in the backyard, I'm carrying my stick, and I'll be doing that for a while. Yesterday was the first time I used the grill in a month. I had the stick in my hand as I'm trying to pull the cover off the grill, and then I used the stick to get the grill open, and then I stood four or five feet away trying to do my best to just double check. And I, I, I battled, and part of what I battled last night was I don't think there's a, if you if there's any carpenters that aren't afraid of snakes, you want to earn some brownie points. Come to my house tomorrow and do some inspecting underneath of that bay window and make sure there's no rotted out holes into the house. But that's 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 one of the primary tactics of the enemy is fear. It's intimidation. And I'm going to tell you, and I know I, I'm trying not to say too much until I get to where I need to go because I don't want you putting up barriers and walls before I get to where it, at least give me a chance to tell you what I believe the Lord's given me. But I, I, I don't think I'm of the opinion, and I could be wrong, I don't think there's hardly ever any times that we battle the devil in here.
Because this is like an embassy. And the enemy cannot go in an embassy. It's an act of war. The devil is absolutely stupid to try to come into an atmosphere like this. And so most of the time, he's not battling us here. If we're battling, we're battling flesh. Now, I didn't say he never comes because I felt him a little bit. To, this has been a chaotic. They had problems with sound and not people problems. It wasn't anybody's fault, so just to be clear. But they had problems with sound and media and all from the very beginning today. And it's, stuff has been glitching and whatever all day long. And, and you can Write it off to coincidence if you want. But I'm going to tell you, the enemy is absolutely fine with us doing whatever we want to do inside this building. He doesn't have a... You do whatever you want to do here. But when it comes to recognizing that we are salt and light in the world, that's when he rises up and is not willing just to sit back and let us do whatever we want to do. Let me tell you why you are let me tell you why you are here. Well, we spend weeks and months and years fasting and praying, God, what's my purpose? Here it is. You're here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? Christianity, church attendance is on the decline. I am of the opinion there's a lot of wrong reasons being given for that. I think one of the primary reasons is right here. The salt has lost its saltiness. So how are people knowing what godliness is? You've lost your usefulness and will end up in the garbage Here's another way to put it. You're here to be salt and light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. Now just let me go ahead and ease the, the apprehension, some of you. There is no outreach evangelism plans and efforts about to be announced tonight because God have mercy that we have to do that. The reason that we have to have organized outreach and evangelism efforts is because we're not simply being who we're called to be. So if you think that's where we're going, you, your spiritual discernment is off. We have been called to be salt and light. He said, you are salt and light. That's what you are. That's not, that's not what you do. That's what you are. There's a difference between what we do and who we are. He said, you are salt and you are light. Now, now there's something interesting about these two things. And, 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 and I'm not sure, at least with salt, especially that it's absolutely completely the case but it is the majority of the time but the scripture says with regards to light it says this in John 1 and verse 5 in the King James it says the light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not so 2022 you say the word comprehend and for us that pretty much has to do with thinking and, and, and mental faculties but, but really what that word means and the living Bible gives it a little bit clearer definition or explanation the darkness can never extinguish it. And one of the unique things about light and salt is they don't tend to be affected by what else is coming against them. They affect the other thing. Darkness can never extinguish light. The only way for darkness to extinguish light is somebody's got to turn off the light. Because as long as there's light shining, darkness has no chance of doing anything. It cannot extinguish the light. And so he said we are light and he said we are salt. There are some things that if you mix them together, what is the more dominant flavor varies. But to my knowledge, I think it's safe to say salt never takes on the flavor of its whatever it touches. It affects what it touches. It changes. It's not always that way with everything. 
We are experiencing the fact tonight that cold air and hot air is not always a guarantee who wins. The cold air is trying, but the warm air is winning. But turn on the light, darkness has no chance. Start adding salt, and it's going to start affecting what it's touching. And that's the what he said. You and I are called to be salt and light. God, have mercy on people that are called to be salt and light, that go into settings in this world and take on the flavor or the identity of the circumstances they're in rather than continuing to be who they are. So... How many of you believe God, not a trick question, I have one, if you weren't here this morning, I, I managed to get one for the year, so I, I'm probably done, so you can answer any question I ask. How many of you believe God can speak to you in a variety of ways? I mean, bottom line is if he could speak through a donkey, I think that tells you he could pretty much. Another message for another night, but just because he speaks through you, you might not want to get too puffed up. He spoke through a donkey. Just because you've got a message to say doesn't mean God is validating the messenger. If he's got a message to get across, he's usually willing to use whatever vessel he's got to use to get the message across. But I believe, and, and I realize there wasn't some of the things we have in the world in the day of Scripture, but I think if they were there, we'd have, had some, we'd have read some examples of how God used some of those things. I, I can't tell you when, I really don't. I've tried to pinpoint it, and I haven't succeeded, and it's not necessarily all that important. But, but I will tell you for, I would say, at, at least a month now, at least a month, the verses that I have just read to you have been churning in my spirit. And really, basically, these two words have been churning in my spirit. Salt and light. Salt and light. And, and I've, I've just, it, it's not that I've ignored them or rejected them, but I, I just, I've just kind of, in, in some ways, brushed them off. Again, not in the sense of rejecting them, but just, okay, whatever. But, but I, I, I've, had, I've had for me what is a pretty unique experience because, again, going on, uh, well, actually it's probably even a little bit more than a month now. We've already been home from vacation almost two weeks, and so it was several weeks before we went out of town that, that this passage first started just kind of sitting in my spirit. So we... Uh, we, we most of you know we went on vacation, went to went to Hawaii, and uh, and and we did a couple different activities throughout that that trip. And the first activity we did was uh, we got there on Saturday, and on that Monday we we did a downhill bike tour. Brother Benner, if all bike riding was like that, I would be in because the description is very accurate. It was downhill. There was a short stretch where you actually really had to pedal for probably a quarter of a mile. The rest of it was downhill. One point, Timothy and I got behind the guide. I was behind the guide. Timothy was behind me. We were coming down that hill, and, and according to his Apple Watch, we hit at least 42 miles an hour coming down that hill. I ain't never been going that fast on a bike in my life, but that was a blast. He got tucked down in an aerodynamic position. I got tucked down in what was apparently not quite as aerodynamic because I was still losing ground, and Timothy must have been more aerodynamic because he was having to tap the brakes a little bit not to overrun me. That was fun. But it, the, the, the way it worked was we met this group. It was a, it was a tour, and, and we met, and there was about 10, 12 people counting or not counting. The two guy, There was two guides. We got in the van, it was a 15-passenger van, and not sure how it really happened totally, but Timothy and Nathaniel ended up in the back seat, and then I ended up in the seat in front of them, and sitting next to me was this, I think he said he was around 20 years old, and as we're sitting in the parking lot, we start to talking, and he was from California, and uh, what was dope, right? Was it dope? Yeah. Everything you kind of 
per picture of a stereotypical Californian, he was it. He and I started talking, and he, you know, somehow, you know, what do you do or something? I, I'm a pastor. Oh, dude, that's dope, man. <laughs> and uh, so he, we carried a little bit of conversation on, well, well, we, so we, we start out there pulling all the bikes in the trailer behind, and we start up this road that's taking us up to the mountain, and and uh, there's a couple of uh, there's a couple of scenic overlooks along the way. Sister Tyler, oh, you are you're not watching. You're here, so here we go. You you said you couldn't wait for some of my stuff, so you're getting it all tonight. So uh, we're 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 riding up, and so they they had a couple of spots where they would pull off that weren't official scenic overlooks, and there was a path, and they would take us there. And and so we're driving up, and the, and the very first stop we 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 get off. The van, and I think I stepped out first, but then that guy that was sitting next to me gets off. And I look at his shirt, and it says salt and light. Now, I'm, come on, God, I'm on vacation now. You gotta... Now, I, I understand, I understand that that's a, I, there, there's, I would say the majority of you here this evening You've heard those verses many times before. It's not that it's uncommon, but i got to tell you, I, I've never seen the phrase in a common way and standing right there in front of me. And that was dope. <laughs> Let me, dude, it was... I, you know, okay... All right, but, you know, I mean, all right. Two days later, we're out and about doing stuff. We go to this place. It was some kind of old warehouse, and they turned into a place for shops and a little different variety of little shops. And so my wife and my sons were milling around. I had skimmed, scanned real quick. It doesn't take me very long. I found me a place to sit, and I'm sitting there, and I was actually piddling around on my phone for a few minutes, and after a few minutes of sitting in my chair, I just happened to look up. And the name of the store right in front of me is Salt and Light. I mean, one's, you can write that off, I think it's coincidence. I'm not really sure how you write off two as coincidence. That already had me thinking. Maybe God's been trying to really talk to me. I need to pay attention. We get home Wednesday, late Wednesday evening. Thursday evening is Oikos gathering night. We got jet lag. We didn't end up falling asleep till almost 4 a.m. Friday morning from jet lag. So I was wide awake when Oikos reports started coming in Thursday night. I start reading through the Oikos reports. One of the ones that came in on Thursday night said a part of the lesson they discussed that night was we get so busy that we forget we are the t-shirt. A sign, an Oikos report, by the mouth of two or three witnesses. I come up to the church on Friday, first time at the building, came up here, I forgot what we were doing, and I know they're there, and obviously I knew they were there, but I'd kind of forgotten two or three witnesses, um, Four. Now, if you want to write that off to coincidence, I wouldn't mind writing it off to coincidence. But I don't think that's coincidence. Because we've spent four years focused on getting the foundation and things in place, not only to be able to take care of what's already here, 
But I'm telling you tonight, there is a shift that the Holy Ghost is bringing to this congregation. I was just waiting last Sunday morning as Brother Hurt was ministering about the wilderness and God using it. I was just waiting at some point he was going to say something about salt and light. And he never did. But while he never said anything about salt and light, really the context of what he was saying was about being salt and light. And I've come to tell Antioch Central tonight, it's time for us to get a fresh fresh revelation of who and what we are. That you and I have been called to be salt and light to this world. We've been called to affect the atmosphere wherever we go. We've been called to bring change, not to be changed. Salt and light. I've had a weird, I don't, and there's, don't, there's not going to be any great punchline to this, so don't be waiting on it, but I, I've just had an odd experience several times over the last several weeks. There have been a few times where I've been out, and, and, and it happened a time or two while we were on vacation, but it, it's been other places and other times, Brother Middleton, where I've been in, in, a, in, a, in a relatively sizable group of people, and all of a sudden, kind of out of nowhere, something just begins to churn in my mind that I am the most senior spiritual authority here. Yeah. I've been in restaurants and it's just kind of hit me. I've been in different places where it's just kind of, I, I am the most senior spiritual authority here. You. Unless you, unless we're up now, right now, not everybody's the most senior spiritual authority. There, there is a spiritual hierarchy, not on individual importance, but, but based on God's structure of authority, submission, and whatever. So maybe not here right now, but tomorrow when you walk into your job, I need, now listen, y'all, y'all need to get with me tonight because the, uh, if, if, if what happens, happens, we're going to be on this for a little while and, and in the next couple of weeks or so, we're going to talk about that negative part of being trodden underfoot. Because if you don't get a hold of the fact of what you're supposed to be and do, then you lose your flavor, you lose your, your savor, and therefore you're no good for anything but to be trodden underfoot. I don't know about you, but I don't want to become a congregation that loses its savor, and therefore we have no impact. And God says you're not really good for anything anymore, so I'm going to go on to somebody else else you are you are the you are the spiritual authority the problem is we 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 sort of get what we project ever been in a room where somebody walked in that had absolute confidence in who they were I don't mean spiritually speaking. I mean just in a natural setting. Some of you deal with it in the workplace all the time. Somebody walks in the room and they, they, know, they're, they know they're the boss. They know they're in charge. And they walk in acting like they are. And I don't mean necessarily in a... I mean, I know some people misuse that. In a, I'm not really talking about it in a negative way right now. They just they, they sort of, as we say, they command respect because they know who they are. Do you know what the enemy is? does not want you to get the revelation of who you are. In fact, he's okay with you having a revelation of who he is. He doesn't care if you have a revelation of who Jesus is. Who do you say that I am? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood. He, the first revelation was who God was because everything's got to be based on the revelation of who God was. But closely connected to the revelation of who God was, Peter had to get a revelation of who he was because if he didn't get a revelation of who he was, he would have never done what he did. Some of you, the enemy has spent so much time trying to keep you 
caught in a corner somewhere because he knows the moment you decide to believe who you are, that you are salt and you are light, he can't do anything with you. I'm not talking about arrogance and cockiness and pride, but I am talking about confidence in who you are and what you are. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. Praise God. You, ever, you, you know what would happen if some guy in the major leagues was, was walking, up to the bait, walking up to the plate for his at bat with his head hanging down, dragging the bat behind him because he, he's nervous and worried about going up to the plate? That manager would yank him in a heartbeat. I realize we can't do in the flesh what has to be done in the spirit. I'm not saying any, I'm not saying it's about your talent and ability, but it is about getting a revelation of who you are and what you are and believing that whether it's walking into the convenience store, whether it's walking into a restaurant, walking into your job, you are impacting the atmosphere because you are salt and light. Oh, Jesus. I got a question. I don't mean by your, I, 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 I've never done that in all my years. I never did what I did earlier, asking you to demonstrate how glad you were without your words. But I got a question. How many of, how many of the people on your job, how many people know that you're a born-again believer? They need to know at some point by your words, but I don't mean by your words. Because according to the words I just read to you of Jesus, that people ought to be fairly freak, whether they ever say it or not, people ought to be fairly regularly passing by you going, there's something, something different about them. And I don't mean the way you dress may be a part of it. I'm talking about something besides the way you dress. I'm talking about something that is radiating, something that is emanating from you. And, 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 and it is time for us to have a mind shift in the fact that we're not here to just get, 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 but we're here to be. We're here to season the world around us. We're here to bring some light into a dark place. what we're called to do. It's what we're called to be. You are salt and light. I, I've, I've preached it at, at times in the past. I realize most of you, some of you, maybe God's given you the opportunity to, and, and, and God bless you. I don't really want to know because I'll have to work through jealousy. But I, I don't think most of us ever really see it. But I believe with all of my heart that everywhere we go, it's, it's as if it was a ship in the sea. That if you are a born-again child of God, everywhere you go, you're like the bow of that boat. That's causing a disturbance. And again, I realize you may not see it with your physical eye, and you may not oftentimes feel it, but what would happen if we really started believing? When I walk into a setting, I am creating a disturbance in the Spirit. I'm bringing light. And wherever I go with light, darkness cannot overtake the light. You know how many of us are, 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 are essentially capped right now in our walk with God in ministry? The reason is is because we're not being. We do, we, we do sometimes, but we're not being. Because what Jesus was talking about was not a, a, an organized uh, a, a ministry of the church, a department of the church. I'll be in this ministry, I'll be in that ministry, but I'm not. No, he was saying to all of us, you are salt and you are light. You are salt and you are light. 
and, 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 and I'm going to say this also. I've already told you a few things where maybe if you think this is going, this is not about going to get you, trying to get you to invite people to church. Because it will be salt and light. If we'll season their lives and bring some flavor to it, if we'll shine the light to where they are, that will be the byproduct. You know what happened? We had a lady here this morning. Lives in Arnold. Several days ago, I think. A couple days ago. Felt led to come up on the hill. Just drove up on the hill. Early morning, I hopefully this Brother Johnson wasn't because the lockup man didn't do his job the night before, but early in the morning, nobody around, she walked all through the building. Said she, said she heard a humming, I think. So she was trying to find it. She never found the humming, but she felt something. She came back this morning. A couple of people talked to her. I had a chance to talk to her for a moment after service. I've been Catholic, she said. Oh, I, I, I'm, I mean, this might not be exact quote, but just, I, I, I don't like church. I didn't like church, but I, I like what I feel here. You know what? I believe in the last days that's going to happen more and more. But it's not going to happen more and more when we're just sitting inside these four walls in joy. It's going to happen more and more. The more we are salt and light in the world, the more that's going to happen. Again, I'm, this is not about inviting people to church, so please don't misunderstand the example I'm about to use. It's the principle of it I'm trying to use. Brother Mallory, I have referenced you so many different times through the years because I can remember for years we had a, a, a 5 o'clock meeting with Bishop Wright and, and all the, the ministry leaders, all the daughter work leaders, every Sunday evening, 5 o'clock. And, and I can remember the Mallory's were leading the group on Fort Meade for uh, a number of years. And I can remember, I, I, I feel like I've heard you say this several times. I know it was more than once. But I can remember you coming in, they go around the room and give reports. And Brother Mallory would say, well, we went out on outreach next yesterday and we knocked a bunch of doors and invited a bunch of people to church and not one person we invited yesterday came but when we came in this morning we had a couple other guests show up so I, I believe God's going to draw more and more but he's not going to draw more and more as a way for us to not have to be salt and light he's going to draw more and more when you and I are being salt and light in the world you know what, the interesting thing, we, we, had, we had some steaks yesterday. I mean, if I'm going to go through all the, tra the trauma of using that grill again, it's going to be more than just hot dogs on it. We, put some, we did some steaks, and, 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 and so before I put some seasoning on them, my wife put a little bit of salt. You ever notice you don't put what you're cooking in the container of salt? You, you, you shake the salt on what it is. I wonder how many times we're just trying to get people in the, in the, in the Morton salt thing. It's not a jar. What's it called? The cardboard, whatever, container. When we're supposed to be getting the salt out of the container. You don't get somebody inside the light to get the light. You turn the light on. And, and, and here's, here's, here's the thing. Some of you need to realize there's some things you're waiting on that God's not doing because purpose determines providence. Hmm. I'm going I'm I'm to explain in a moment. I'm going to explain that. Purpose determines providence. According to good old Webster's Dictionary, providence is simply divine guidance or care. Anybody tonight need some divine guidance or some divine care with some stuff in your life? Prov uh, 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 purpose 
determines providence. And here's the problem. James 4 and in in verse 2 in the King James, it says, You have not because you ask not. And then for all of us to say, well, all of us that can say, well, I've been asking, the next verse explain. You ask, but you ask amiss. And so you don't get what you're asking for because you're asking for it to consume it upon yourself. The Living Bible says it this way. You want what you don't have, so you kill to get it. Oh, I I never killed anybody to get what I want. No, you ain't killed anybody physically, but some of you are killing your relationship with God. Some of you are killing your families because you're putting work and career and job and money ahead of the kingdom. And so you're, you may not have physically killed somebody, but you're killing some stuff. You long for what others have. Some of you don't understand. You look around see people getting blessed and all you see is the blessing they get. You don't understand how they got it. Because of the fact you're asking amiss, you think they got it through devious means or, or they cut corners or something. What you don't understand is, they, is, is some of them, they didn't even ask actually. Because Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom and His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. I've told this one a number of times too. I saw her here early. I don't know where she, where, she, where she went. First year we moved into the house before the one we're in now. Brand new house we were blessed to buy. Brand new house. Beautiful house. Wonderful house. That first year, that first December, we had a, 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 new, a young adult's uh, Christmas Eve fellowship. Sister Yolando Glass walked into the house that night. Made just a few steps inside the door. And yells across the house. I know y'all can't imagine her doing. Where's she at? Where's she at? She out with a listen. <laughs> yells across the house. Pastor, what do I have to do to get a house like this? Without hesitation, I yelled back. Seek ye first the kingdom. Because we weren't trying to get a house like that. We were just trying to do what God had called us to do. And part of what God called us to do was have people into our home and have ministry functions. And so God saw that and provided something else. Some of you don't understand the way some folks around here have gotten some of the things they have. It's not because they've been killing to get it. They've been putting the kingdom first. And God has been adding to them You long for what others have and can't afford it. I'd like to go on vacation to Hawaii. Well, so I I would have and I did. But you know what? I didn't pay for all that vacation. I've been saving. I was saving for the last couple of years because it was going to be my 30th anniversary. So I have been saving as much as I could. But we were blessed with being given a week's timeshare. We were blessed with airfare tickets. So while you're sitting there thinking that, no. You want what others have and can't afford it and don't understand. If you'll be salt and light and put the kingdom first, God has ways of giving you what you can't afford. So you start a fight to take it away from them. And yet the reason you don't have what you want is that you don't ask God for it. Again, well, I ask, okay. And even when you do ask, you don't get it because your whole aim is wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. You want God to bless you financially? Be a giver. You want to be a giver. Yeah, with your finances, but not just with your finances. There's a lot of different ways we're givers than just with our money. But you want to get, then give. Don't try to get it for yourself. Don't try to consume it on, I, I, I want this, I want that for my own benefit, for my own pleasure. If you ask with the right purpose, God will provide. 
And I'm here to tell you tonight, I believe that there is a whole nother level of sovereign, of God's sovereignty that he wants this congregation to experience. But it's got to be for the right motive and the right reasons. I, 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 I came, across, uh, came across something the other day. And uh, it, was, it, was a, uh, it was a video on YouTube of an interview and uh, took place in the late 90s. And, and uh, Brother Paul Mooney, who served as pastor of Calvary Tabernacle in Indianapolis, Indiana, and the president of Indiana Bible College for years, he and another guy that was on the faculty there were interviewing uh, Brother Nathaniel Urshan, who served for, I think, almost 25 years as the general superintendent of the United Pentecostal Church International. And there was, there was just some amazing things he shared. And I've grown up in the United Pentecostal Church, born and raised in it. And uh, I, I, I appreciate the blessings it's been in my life. And so there was just some, there was some amazing things he was sharing. But there, there were two things he shared. And I, I, I just, they, they just so challenged me and, and encouraged me. And, and I, feel like, I feel like in the context of this message tonight, somebody, I, I hope you'll hear this and receive it with faith for, for your own life, your personal life. There was a situation in the, in the 19, I believe it was the early 1980s, and um, called the Siberian 7. There may be a few folks around here that, that were around back then and remember that. And I, I've got, there's a little picture of a book that, that, uh, that's about it. But in June 1978, seven Pentecostals had the courage to go, that font is so small because of the, thing so uh, seven Pentecostals had the courage to go to the American embassy one of them distracted the guards while the other six escaped into the embassy embassy gate and managed and then managed to make his way inside how they did this is a little foggy because these Soviet guards were diligent they claimed it was a miracle it was also a miracle that the Americans in the embassy accepted them into the building. They lived in the embassy, in the American embassy, the basement of it, until they were allowed to leave for the United States five years later on June 27, 1983. In the course of all of this, there was... <laughs> I just, I want you to, I, I preach this, I don't remember the specific title, but I preached a message uh, uh, along the lines of, uh, I, I think I called it divine coincidence, I think, or divine chaos, that, that God is, God is orchestrating the steps of your life. And for all of us that don't have the experience of God telling us every little thing to do every single moment of the day, I want you to know God is in control if you're living for the right purpose. And so, this all had obviously at this point been going on for several years. And, and, and uh, anybody remember? I don't know. They may still have it. I remember it for a good portion of my life. But in the, in the Sunday paper, of course, we don't get the Sunday paper anymore. Anybody remember reading Sunday comics? Man, that was a highlight of the Sunday. I couldn't wait to get home to get the Sunday. What was the one with the caveman? Uh, anyway. But anybody remember in the Sunday paper, there was, it, there was the Parade Magazine. Anybody remember that? You tell all the young people. What's a newspaper? It just so happened that on the front page of that parade magazine, apparently there was an article about the Siberian 7. And so there were some ministers in the United Pentecostal Church that reached out to Brother Urshan and said, you know, I guess whatever, are we doing anything? Can we do anything? So Brother Urshan and three other ministers, one of them was the, North, was the global, they used to call it foreign missions, it's now global missions. There will be a test after service. The, the, the man that was the, the foreign missions director at the time and uh, another man that was a missionary and then another pastor. So the three of them went with Brother Urshan to Russia. They went to Russia with the intent of trying to help get the Siberian 7 freed. They went with no connections and no plan, but they had a purpose. They get to Russia 
And within a, just a short time of being in Russia, I don't know how quickly it was. He didn't give all, this, all the minute details. But they went into a department store, and he said apparently this department store was only, uh, only foreigners were allowed to go in this department store. And, and so they took him in there to shop some, and they're walking around, and he hears this American talking. And Brother Urshan says to one of the pastors that's with him, that guy's a Texan if I ever heard one. So Brother Urshan goes over to this guy and says, Hey, are you from Texas? And the guy responds and says, You bet your boots I am. <laughs> and he, says to, uh, he says to Brother Urshan, what, what, are, what, are, what are you doing here? And he said, Well, I'm, I'm here. And we're trying to see if we can help get the Siberian 7 freed. He said, oh, really? I guard them at the embassy. How are you planning to get there? <laughs> oh, y'all, somebody should have got a little more excited than that. Walking through a department store and a random Texan that works at the embassy gets connected with the group of people that's trying to get to the embassy to the group of people. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Oh, Lord. I'm, I'm, trying, to deter, I'm trying, to, trying to make up my mind I'm battling the devil right now. Because if I ain't battling the devil, that's not a good thing. If, if, if the resistance I'm feeling isn't the devil, there, there's only one other option. And that can't be because you people are too good for that. And, and, and so that, <laughs> then he goes to the embassy and it just so happens the ambassador is on vacation. And the second man in charge is the grandson of a UPC preacher. They end up spending over the course of the next five or six days, I think several hours a day, sitting with that group of people praying and talking. All because somebody had a purpose to be salt and light and started moving. Can I tell you, I'm afraid some of us have become Rama junkies. Because we won't take a step until we get a rhema. And some of us won't take a step until we get a rhema. And then we have a fleece on the ground for a couple of days. And then we go down to the enemy's camp and hear the enemy talking about a dream he had about us. Some of you are... I was going to say fat with words from God, but that wouldn't be nice. Some of you have got so many words and rhemas from God that you are weighted down with and you're still waiting for one more confirmation, one more word. And God's sitting there going, if you will just move. And you, I, I, I gotta tell. I mean, I'm gonna be honest with you. I'm not sure if I'd have done the same thing. I mean, if I finally had everything in order, I might have went. But four men just said, "Kind of sounds like four men I've heard about in the Old Testament." We sit here. We're gonna die. We go into the city, there's a famine there, we're going to die. We go to the enemy's camp, the worst thing that's going to happen is we're going to die, but they'll probably make it quicker. So, I read the verse this morning, Jonathan sitting there, all the Philistines, I mean all the children of Israel, all the soldiers of Israel are sitting around, the, the enemy has taken all the weapons of war, and, and, and finally Jonathan's sitting there and he has enough, and he says to his armor bearer, let's go. See, let's go see if God will do something. Can you imagine what would have happened if Jonathan had waited to get a word? I, 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 I can hear a few of you. Well, Brother Wright, I'm sorry, but I've, I've tried. Well, just, just give me a moment. They just, they just decided, here's a need. We're going to go be salt and light. 
He didn't, they didn't, this is what, I know this is what I, I, I don't, I don't think I'm really waiting on it anymore. I'm still hoping to get it. But they weren't, they weren't praying and fasting until God said, Thus saith the Lord to you, my son, go to such and such department store. They just, they just went shopping. And some of you wives, don't be using that against me. Pastor said, I just need to go shopping. They, they just went shopping. And there just so happened to be this loud mouth guy who just so happens to be the guy that can get him. What are the chances of that? I, I'm sorry, you want to call that coincidence? Then you surely you believe in evolution also. Because I don't know how you can believe in creation and think that's a coincidence. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. I don't have time and to, to, to go way in depth in this. I'm just going to give you a basic overview. And some of you, unfortunately, probably have never even heard this name. But, but, but this is actually Brother Nathaniel Urshan's father. Brother Andrew Urshan, a, a Pentecostal pioneer. He got the Holy Ghost, the baptism of the Holy Ghost in the early 1900s. He was, he was mightily used of God to... to, to Help establish, I guess, if you will, the Pentecostal work in Russia. Brother, Brother Urshan, Brother Nathaniel Urshan, in this interview, it was 1999, and he said in 1999 it was estimated that there were over 2 million people in Russia that were believers as a result of his father. I would have suspected that the way he got to Russia would have been similar to Paul's experience with that vision he had of that guy from Macedonia saying, come over to us. A dream. A word. A brother hurt calling you out. I, I, that's what I would have thought. Some kind of amazing supernatural experience. Most of you are intuitive enough to know that where I'm going, that that's not the case. He got the Holy Ghost, got saved in the U.S. He went back what was at that time called Persia, what is now called Iran. Iran. And he went back there, and the reason he went back there was to try to convert his family. So he goes home to be salt and light. In the process of going back to Persia, he loses his passport. And as a result of losing his passport, they sent him to Russia. He gets to Russia and somehow gets connected with a, a group of Finnish brethren and begins to connect with them and as they say, the rest is history. Two million souls because of a lost passport. Two million souls because of a lost passport. Purpose determines providence some of you are sitting around waiting for God to do some great things on your behalf and God saying if you'll just be some salt and light I've got some things I'm going to do that's exceeding abundantly above all that you would ask or think but, but I've, I need you to be before I can do oh come on brother right I, I've tried it before yeah that's what Peter said when Jesus calls out and says, let down your nets. But Master, we've toiled all night and we've caught nothing. 
I wish tonight, by the help of the Lord, every person a part of this congregation would get a nevertheless in their spirit. Because Peter responds after saying, I've already tried that. And it didn't work. Nevertheless, at your word. And he brought in a great draught of fishes, too much to even contain. Some of you need a nevertheless. Because if you don't get a nevertheless, you're going to miss out on the providence that God has for you. Because you may have tried before and it didn't work. But when the time is right, I, I said it this morning to the deacons in our pre-service prayer, and I'm going to say it here tonight. You know, Brother Bishop, I don't believe in this idea that some seem to have where there is sort of almost this magical moment of revival that's going to come. I, I don't believe that. But what I do believe, and I think I can very easily demonstrate this throughout Scripture, there is such a thing as timing. And so while it may not, I don't think we're supposed to be waiting on this elusive great revival, Brother Mott. I also know if you go out to the cornfield in the middle of the winter, you ain't getting nothing but dried up ears of corn. You've got to go at the right time if you're going to harvest corn. Man, we had some good corn yesterday. You ain't never eaten no corn, good corn on the cob until you just got through shucking it. Get them silky things off and just start chowing down. There ain't nothing like raw, sweet corn. Mmm. Might have to go find some tonight. The timing. Jesus' name. The timing. It's got to be the right timing. Forty years, they wandered in a wilderness. I'm pretty sure that in that 40 years, there was at least a time or two where they walked by the Jordan River and kept walking. But when the timing was right, that time they came to the Jordan. And I'm sure, I am sure, oh, gee, let me tell you something. We, 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 have, we have been bumping for, for years. I'm just going to say, Brother Middleton Sr., we've been bumping for years a spirit of unbelief that's trying to take hold in this church. Because, Sister Evans, we've heard it all. Brother Evans, we've heard it. You guys have been here since the mid-early 70s. A few other folks, we've heard it. Men of God have come through. We've seen the Jordan and kept walking. There had to have been some times where they came to the Jordan initially and there was some excitement. Hey, there's the Jordan. The promised land is on the other side. We're getting ready to cross. And next thing you know, they take a turn. Start for another lap. But when the time came, the Lord said to Joshua, you need to tell the congregation, get ready for tomorrow. Tomorrow. So, so I don't think there's some elusive, mystical thing we're waiting on. But I also know there is a timing. And your job and my job is to be preparing when the, for when the timing comes. And so I realize we've let down some nets before and brought nothing. And you know what? I'll just go ahead and just say it. This may be another false start. But all I know is this. There's coming a time. That we've let down the nets before and brought in nothing. But this time, when we put those nets down, it's going to be more than we can handle. So I, I know some of you may be battling a little bit discouragement. But would you let it rise up inside of you and say, Nevertheless, at your word.
I called. I'm, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Like I, I, I've heard this. Many of you have heard this, but I just wanted to, I wanted to reaffirm a few things. So I, I called my dad. I texted him first, and then, and then we talked for a little while yesterday afternoon. I got to tell you, and I don't think I'm the only one that feels this way. So, so I, I, I'm not implying that at all about what I'm about to say. But I got to tell you, I, 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 I don't want to live. I don't want to survive as a church off of all the great stories of the past. I, 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 that's not good enough. I, I'm not a history buff. I, my, my wife has kind of been, you know, chided me kindly a few times when I've made this point. Obviously, I haven't learned yet, so maybe I'll learn after this time. But I, I just, I don't, I'm not into history. I don't, and we, some of you are history buff, and there's nothing wrong with that. I, I don't have, a, I'm just saying, I just, I don't. As long as there's a lot of pictures or displays in the museum, I'm good. I, I, I hate going to museums with people that got to read every article. I need about 15 minutes in this section to look, and 30 minutes later, you're on the second display. I, I, I know we need that, and I, I know there's some value, so don't get me wrong. And, all of you kids, don't go home and tell your parents. You don't have to worry about history because Pat, no, no, no. I, I, I got to tell you, I mean, we, 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 we uh, I didn't plan this one, Sister Tyler. It's all your fault. I'm blaming it all on you. We, we went to, and I know some others of you have been there. We, we, we took the tour for, the, uh, for Pearl Harbor and, um, and the USS Arizona. And, and, and if you're not familiar with it, there's this... Um, I, I, I don't really know what you call it, but it's this deck, whatever, kind of, it's built directly over top of the USS Arizona, and, and you take a boat ride out, and, and, and you have some time to walk around. You can see the ship underneath. It's got, this is amazing, that, that two days before the uh, Arizona was, was bombed, it was, it was freshly fueled up with over a million and a half gallons of fuel, because it was supposed to be heading back to California. And to this day, there are drops of oil. They call it the black tears. They come to the surface. And I mean, there, there's, you know, there's something so surreal about standing. And then really, and this is probably one of, I think out of all the places I've been, everything I've ever done as far as history goes, this one was probably one of the most... I mean, amazing experience. We, we went to the USS Missouri, and we stood on the deck at the spot where the treaty was signed to end the war. I mean, we, were, we, we stood right there. That, that's pretty cool. I, I don't ever expect us to repeat that. I hope we don't have to repeat that. But I'm going to tell you, I'm not interested Man, there's we could we could we could spend the next 24 hours and not leave just going around from elder to elder. I don't mean elder in the sense of a congre. I mean the the precious elders, the elder saints of this church, telling the stories about the things that God has done in the history of this church. Sister Gross, we can't live off of that. Thank God for it. Thank God for what He's done. But you know, I. I so I, I, I went to Bishop and I, or we, caught, we talked yesterday. Do you know that, some of you may not know this, I think he said it was about four and a half years in, the high, they had their record attendance. Four and a half years in, anybody want to take a guess what the record attendance was four and a half years in? Somebody take a guess. Twelve. Anybody else want to take four and a half years in, what was their high record Sunday? I think it was an Easter. Anybody take a guess? 20, 30, 21. Um, you need to go up a little bit. 55. 90. Ooh, well, we're really getting there. 250. Boy, we're really. I don't have all night. Eight, over 800 people. Now, there ain't nothing wrong with this. A big portion of that was kids. Because do you know? that within the first couple of years, there was 10 buses with 50 people 
running 10 buses. Two, they would go out, pick up kids, bring them to church, go through the whole thing, take them home and pick up another group and come back. The same people that did all the going and getting and dropping off were the same people that taught the classes. Bishop said at that time, he told me yesterday, at that time there was about 70 people considered to be faithful people in the church. 50 of those people were committed. Doing all of that. 800 plus people. If you combine the three congregations to attendance from this morning, I'm pretty sure it wouldn't be 800. But you know what? One of the differences between them and where we tend to be now, their purpose. And they were going to be salt and light. And, and boy, we've, we've, we've matured. We know how to do spiritual warfare. We know how to intercede. We know how to do all this great stuff inside the salt shaker. They, they, they were, they were, I, I can, it's been a long time, but I can remember as a teenager and even in my young adult years, I can remember being out in public with my parents and adults coming up to my parents in the mall and various places and they'll walk up and say, hey, Pastor Wright, hey, Sister Wright, remember me? And they'd be like, um, n- no, sorry, I really don't. And they'd say, I was one of those kids that came on the buses. Seeds that had been sown and planted. I, I, I got to tell you, and I, I'm trying to be careful because, again, you, you, hopefully you're hearing me. This, this, this message tonight, this, this, this isn't about an evangelism outreach effort. This is about us being. Because there is a world that needs salt and light. It's about us being. And, 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 and so Bishop said, he shared this passage with me. I want to share it with you, and I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping up. I'm not going to read the, all the context of it. But in the course of the Lord speaking to the king of Israel at that time, he says this to him, Be strong, therefore, and let not your hands be weak, for your work shall be Rewarded. Some of you have toiled all night and caught nothing. But the stuff I, those pictures, I, again, I, if you want to call all that coincidence, call it coincidence. But I, I just can't believe all that's coincidence. And then again, I, I know he didn't specifically say it this, I know he didn't say it. Uh, Sunday morning, but everything, brother, uh, a lot of, let me say, a lot of what brother Hurt was preaching Sunday morning about being in the wilderness, being in a wilderness, but 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 making way for Jesus in that wilderness. That that really is just another way of of salt and light. There is, I believe, there is a shift that is it is happening. I'm not saying gonna happen is happening. That we have spent these last six years, and as I've already said, Brother Barr, you know as well as anybody in this room, uh, grow. It's not perfect. It's not everything it should be, and it's not everything it's going to be, but it's good enough. And, 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 and we've still got some things we're working on with Oikos that we, we need more development and more growth, and, but, but, but it's, it's working. Man, there, there's some things. I, I've watched some people in the last couple of years that have just absolutely flourished in their walk with God and, 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 and things happening because of what's happened in their, in their oikos. And so, again, that's not perfect, but, but it's working. Man, the, the youth ministry, we, we've thank God for all the foundations. We, we help lay foundations, and, and, and the McGurks have helped lay. But I'm, I'm telling you what, we, we've got a fresh new youth team, and I'm, you want to talk about some people. I, I've been hearing some things through my my uh, my daughter and my son, uh, the youth pastors, about some of you. They've been talking about some of you. Sarah, you've been talked about. And I'm telling you what. Boy, there, there is, man, there's a team. There, there, there's some other areas that we've lengthened the cords. We've strengthened the stakes. And he says, when you do that, you will. 
you will break forth. We're going to break forth by being. I know, Brother Lewis, you, 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 you probably not, but I wouldn't be surprised if you're sitting over there going, well, it's about time you're preaching this, Pastor. That's what we've been doing. <laughs> you know what? It's what I, 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 again, I, I'm not. I, somebody, well, you know, I'm just not an extrovert. I just have trouble. The problem is some of you don't need to talk to people yet. Because some of you, if you start trying to be salt and light with your mouth, they're going to start thinking about all your actions. And thinking, well, you, you haven't been seasoning this place for the good. You, you, you haven't been shining a light in this place, but you want to. So just start by being. Just start by being the kindest, nicest person in your office. Just start by being the best worker on the job. Just start by being the best manager in your workplace. Just start by being the nicest neighbor in your neighborhood. Just start by, oh boy, some of you are going to fall out on with me on this one, but just start by being the best tipper at the restaurant. I've pretty much gotten in any time you got that add 10, 20, 30, 40, whatever percent, even if that person's just simply doing what they're paid to do. I've been thinking, you know what? There's probably a lot of people that don't give them any extra. So they, 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 may, never, they may never walk through those doors, but who knows? Who knows what that act might do to start stirring something? And who knows what doors may open someplace else? And, the, and so again, it's not about us trying to fill a sanctuary. Because even if we fill the sanctuary, there's still a bunch of people that need Jesus. I, 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 there, there's a young man, some of you may remember. He was, he was, I think he was a part of the youth group when my wife and I were youth pastors. Sister Trashier was, was one of our young people. Didn't we do an awesome job? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> remember, I, I, think, I think her name was April. Remember April and Nathan Britt? I think there was Britt. Anybody remember that name? They, they were young people when we were youth pastors, and they moved because I think their family was military or something, I believe. They moved away, and just, I, I, I didn't know it, whatever happened. But about a year or two ago, I think it was through faith. Anybody else remember them? A couple of others of you were youth at that time. Just, I think a year or two, I, 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 I got a message. I think it was on, on Facebook. He and his wife, they go to church at the Reynolds Church in Clinton. We had a, we had a, 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 a Maryland, D.C. Section 3. That's the section we're a part of. We had a prayer meeting uh, a couple of months ago, I guess it was. Time just flies by. We went to that prayer meeting. He and his wife and kids were there. Went to youth camp. He and his wife were there with their kids all week long. I, that there was a seed that was sown, and, and we didn't know if anything really came about. So it's, it's not about what we can show. That's why, again, I, I'm going to touch on it again. You may not like it. I, I struggle with this idea of being soul winners because Paul said some sow, some water, but God gives the increase. If the increase happens here, so be it. But the bottom line is somebody just needs to see some light and somebody just needs some salt I want you to stand please In Jesus name I, I, I told you I, if, if, if what happens if what I feel happens this, this is going to, to be in some form or fashion over the, I believe over the next several Sunday nights this is going to be the, the, the basic theme in a lot of different ways but I'm going to tell you just in case you're sitting there waiting they're, 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 this is not leading to some kind of organized evangelism and outreach efforts we've done those in the past I'm not saying we'll never do them again this is not what the, this is about something far greater than that. This is about something much bigger than that. And there, there's there's 200 plus people here tonight. Some of those are children. There, there's probably I would say at least 175 young people and adults, maybe a little bit more. 
175 people in who knows how many different workplaces. Some of you work, some of you work a job in an office and people come to you and we, we've got some people here that, that are in sales and the kind of business you're you're traveling around different places and you're going in and out of different facilities and buildings and whatever. That's 175. Lights. Folks, I don't have to tell you. I don't have it. I don't need it. If you need it, then there's a bigger problem. We're in a broken, messed up, hurting world. And you and I, I don't mean just you and I. There's, there's, I don't mean, hear me, I don't mean just you and I here tonight. But, but I mean you and I here tonight are a part of those that have the answer. We are the salt and the light. That's what we are. It's not just what you do, it's who you are. That's what we've been called to be. And by the help of God, you know what? Some of you have got some stuff you've been praying and praying and praying and praying and waiting for God to do and waiting for God to fix and He hasn't fixed it. Could it be? That the answer is in you being, truly being what you're supposed to be. And as you are being what you are supposed to be, God is going to orchestrate and do things and set things up. You, you, let the, don't let the enemy convince you that you're nothing. Don't let the enemy convince you that you're nobody. You are salt and light. You have what it takes. You know what? There, there's, there's, I don't want to give too much details. I, I don't think I'm really supposed to. But, but, but there's, there's two different Bible studies that, 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 that are taking place on a regular basis each week. That one of them, some of the ladies are doing. The other one, Brother, Brother Mark Lancet's doing. It's some dark situations. And, and, but there's people going in there every week as salt and light. And you know what? Somebody was sharing in a report the other day about it. And, 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 and some of those people, the, the situation, the way it works, you, you, you're with them for a period of time, but then they go off someplace else, and it's kind of hard to keep contact. That doesn't change the effectiveness of the salt. It doesn't change the effectiveness of the light. Brother and Sister Evans, some of their neighbors... Was that last year or 2020? It's all a, all a bird. Was that last year when they came? I can't hear. I can't see either. 2020. Just out, just out taking a walk. I wonder how many opportunities we have missed because we have some kind of illusion of this deep, mystical experience just out taking a walk and basically his neighbors trying to w- minister reach him they're, they're, they, they didn't they, they came ended up coming for a little bit they moved away been watching online and salt light salt light salt changes the you know there are so many people that have no hope you just don't have no hope and and, and therefore the, the first thing out of your mouth doesn't need to be Acts 238 that doesn't have to be I mean my wife said it this morning I, I know it wasn't necessarily spiritual but she told the story this morning of her being out at I think Chipotle with her sister and they were parting ways and Hugging goodbye, and 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 lady walks out and yells, "Hey, I need one of those." I wonder how. I'm not telling you go around hugging people. That's not my point. But I wonder how many people 
that you pass by every day that could use a hug, not willing to tell anybody. And again, I'm not telling you, go just start hugging everybody. It could get you in some big trouble. But my point is, I, I wonder, I mean, I, let's be honest, folks. Sometimes we're good at coming here and pretending that everything's okay. If we're good at that. You know that there's plenty of other people that are good at that. I wonder, I wonder how many people that you work with every single day that you've written off because of the way they seem to be that what you've missed is really everything you're encountering is just the facade to try to hide and cover. Please, please hear me. I beg of you. This, this, this message tonight and what I feel like the Lord has given me and stirring in me, please hear me. This is, this is not intended to come across as a rebuke. Because again, I, I know there, there's people involved, but, but, but I believe there's a, there's, a, there's a shift in our mindset. We've got to become more conscientious of the fact I'm salt. I'm light. You, you are salt. You are light. And here's what's so cool. It doesn't take a whole lot of salt to impact the flavor of something. It, it doesn't take a lot of salt and, and, and you know, here's the problem. Most of us judge our light like this. How much impact did that light have on this room when I turned it on? Did anybody notice? Here, here, let's do it this way. Tell me when, not you guys. T -t Tell me when the light's on or when it's off. Somebody said you can't tell. You can't tell. Oh, you 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 can see it, but it doesn't change anything about the room. Why? Because look around you. You're in a bunch of lights. I'm talking about those. We're all in light. We're all light. But turn off all not don't do it. But turn off every light in this room and then let me do that and no it's not going to make it bright enough for you people in the back to read your Bible but that same light oh Jesus I, I pray that a spirit of revelation would rest upon some people right now that that same light in a dark room will have an impact and no, it might not make it bright as the noonday. But when you walk into your schools and your campuses and your workplace and your neighborhoods, that light makes a difference. You are the light. In the name of Jesus. Come on, I'm done preaching. However you want to respond, however you feel to respond. I, I'm done, there, but there, there's got to be a work of the Holy Ghost. This has got to be more than a sermon. This has got to be more than a motivational message. There needs to be some revelation. There needs to be some revelation tonight of who and what you are. Some of you, the enemy's convinced you you're insignificant. You're so small. You're nothing. It doesn't take but just a little bit of salt. It doesn't take but just a little bit of light to make a difference. Oh, God. I pray that a spirit of revelation would come upon us tonight, God, of who we are and what we are, of the impact that we make on our surroundings and the potential of the impact we can make. Rabo shatara mandaye, 
I wish if some of you elders feel like it. I wish if some of you elders had experienced some of that harvest in the history of this congregation. If you just make your way around a little bit and just lay your hands on some of these younger people, let there be an impartation into them. Let God stir and awaken something in them. We're salt, we're light, we're salt, we're light. We got a lost and a dying world with no hope. You and I are the hope, we're the salt, we're the light. I thank you for everything you've been doing in this congregation, Lord. I thank you for everything you've been establishing, every cord that's been lengthened, every stake that's been strengthened, every way in which we've enlarged our tent. But I pray, God, that there would be a transition, a shift in our minds and in our spirits, that we would go and truly be who and what we are, that we would be salt and light to a world that is in desperate need. Lord, those of us that have been in our wilderness, those of us that have been in our wildernesses, God, let us realize there's somebody in our wilderness that we need to make a way for you for. There's somebody in our wilderness, God, that we need to prepare the way for. As we heard last week, God, rather than looking for a way to get out of our wilderness, rather than looking for you to get us out of our wilderness help us to find those who are in the same wilderness that we can help prepare the way for it only takes a little bit of salt It only takes a little bit of light to impact the darkness. I've said it before. I'm going to say it again tonight. Don't miss the fact. Some of you, the workplace you're in, you need to cut, you need to get confidence. You're in that workplace just as much by God's design as I'm in the role of pastor of this congregation. God has put you there just as much as He's put me here. Maybe you're like that group going to Russia. Or going to Russia. It's not been some supernatural experience, but you're just an available vessel and God is ordering your steps. Maybe it's something as random as a lost passport. But God is positioning. God is positioning you. Your salt. Your light. Your salt. Your light. Oh God, revelation. Let revelation settle on us tonight of who we are and what we are. Here I am. Here I am. You can have it all. You can have it all. Here I am. 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 Here I